the different society in New York. template front end that's connected to the contract. So this is basically the full stack, right? So you have the back end that's on the blockchain on the testnet, and uh, you have a way to communicate to that contract using Web3, which is essentially the API uh, calling package. And then you have a front end and you can adjust it if you know like basic HTML or JavaScript. So, you know, I'm basically providing a uh, full stack template so you can like easily experiment and try stuff and hopefully get stuff to work. Um, so let's do that. So I'm going to go back to sharing my screen. Uh, I hope you can all see my screen. If not, just like, you know, unmute yourself and speak up. Okay, cool. So let's start with a slide. So this is a slide deck I made for a recent conference. Some of the material might be like a little more advanced, may not apply. So I will skim over the part that might be like, uh, tricky, and uh, I will, uh, you know, dive, dive into the part that might be more relevant. So what we're going to try to do is uh, deploy a um, decentralized application, and we're going to go over a very simple contract that basically has a state variable that you can change and you can interact with uh, from your front end and also from uh, Remix. And I'm going to go over some of the standard R dev tools you should know you should probably use. Um, the thing with blockchain development is that like it's actually still quite painful because the field is like just developing. So if you don't use the right tools, you just you know have a lot of headaches for yourself, and it's just very difficult to debug and very difficult to get working. So using the right tools is actually key to success. So I want to show you like the best tools to use that are probably the easiest to go with. Um, so that's the uh, that's the idea. So um, you might know that there is a very uh, like very famous, very popular uh, JavaScript framework called React. Uh, in most cases, uh, you know, in most of the decentralized applications you built today, the front end will be in React. And that's actually what the, you know, the front end template is based out of uh, for our repo as well. So if you have the back end on the blockchain, you talk to it using this package called Web3. Uh, there's also a like equivalent package that's newer, but maybe less developed, less like uh, flushed out in terms of functionality called uh, EtherJS. So that's essentially the communication layer between your front end and your blockchain back end. So we'll talk more details about that. So who am I? My name is Maddie Shang. I, uh, about two years ago, I started learning how to code. So I was basically in your position not long ago. And then, uh, you know, I found the blockchain interesting. So I went about teaching myself, you know, how to code on the blockchain, ended up doing some work for Dash, ended up contributing to a serum based, uh, you know, ecosystem repos. And uh, soon after I found the, you know, the industry to be like a lot more hyped than uh, there was substance, so I decided to pause that and do a deep dive into AI. So now I'm a AI researcher, uh, but I still do a lot of like active development on blockchain for my own projects, etc. So uh, yeah, that's a lot of buzzwords. Cool. So um, why is the blockchain interesting? Why is it important? Uh, you might have already known this, but this is like good review. And these are the things you should think about when you're trying to like essentially build a business case or build a new application. You don't want to be building like the Facebook for cats on the blockchain. Um, you don't want to be building like tennis coin on the blockchain. These are like maybe not so useful. Uh, so you have to think about what are the key properties of blockchain that's going to make your uh, business like use case especially relevant or especially powerful. So the two things that's most important for me is that it's a transparent and immutable ledger. So basically what happens is since the inception of any blockchain, every transaction has been stored and uh, it, it cannot be changed. Like it can be changed, but it's computationally infeasible, right? So it's one like 
universal and like and and uh, unchangeable source of truth. The other thing that's really interesting is that it's trustless in the sense that if I want to do business with you, I don't need to know who you are. I don't need to know your identity. You can stay entirely anonymous. I just need to know you have the right uh, access and right authority to the you know the things we're trying to exchange. Maybe it's like you know a piece of artwork. Maybe it's like uh, some like cryptocurrencies, right? I don't care who you are. I just need to know you have you have authorized access or you have the permissions to um, control assets that were kind of exchanging. So that's actually really cool. Um, so I think what might be useful is uh, talk about un underneath the hood, how do the blocks chain, right? So this is from a uh, older presentation that I did maybe like about a year and a half ago. Um, so yeah, I think we went over this stuff. Private, immutable, transparent, decentralized, trustless. Okay, we did talk about that. Um, so these are some of the cool applications that like we can already achieve on the blockchain. For example, you can send money across the world for cents in minutes. Uh, and that's like not something traditional banks would do for you. And it's also capable of replacing like 80% of accounting and accountants. And also what's really interesting to me because I work at an intersection of blockchain AI is that you can now decouple the computing resource, the uh, you know algorithm model and also the data and then basically set up an exchange, right? Because before, if you had the algorithm and you don't have the, you know, the GPU access, you won't be able to compute. Or if you have the GPU but you don't have the algorithm, like that, just sitting there not doing anything. And also, uh, machine learning requires a lot of data. So even if you have a really good model and you have a really good uh, GPU, um, if you don't get access to the right data, there's nothing you can do, nothing you can like generate either. So this is a way we can like kind of separate all these things, and people who have a little piece can benefit from the exchange in the marketplace. Um, so what exactly is the blockchain is actually extremely well named. It's literally just a chain of blocks, right? So we're going to talk about what are blocks exactly and how do they chain. So I'm going to use a lot of analogies. This is not, you know, the precise technical definition, but it's a good way to understand how this kind of works. So let's just do that. So as you can see this animation here, we have a, uh, you know, we have a box, right? And then, uh, we have these things called transactions that will come into the box. So give it a minute, there's like a transaction, it's gonna go into the box and more transactions will go into the box. So it's literally, a block is literally a uh, open box that's like waiting for transactions to go into it. Cool, so what are transactions? Not surprisingly, transactions are also a chain, right? And there's typically three key parts to a transaction that makes it a chain. So one, you need an incoming transaction. So let's say, uh, you know, I'm sending, I'm sending someone some uh, Ethereum. Well, this Ethereum has to have came from somewhere before I got access to it. So where did this asset come from? That is the incoming transaction. Um, the other thing is uh, like, I also need to tell, you know, other people who is this asset now going to. So if I'm sending, you know, uh, Ethers to one of you, or I'm, trans uh, I'm transferring some kind of asset to one of you, I will need to know your public address, right? So your address is actually part of a key pair. There is a private key and a public key, and the address is the public key, right? And then the other piece is the private key. Like I need to be able to prove that, hey, I actually have legit access to this user I'm trying to send. It would not work if I'm just trying to send someone else's user to someone else. Like that would just be completely chaos, right? So basically if I provide information of where did this money come from, uh, who am I sending it to? I also need to be able to sign the transaction with my own private key to prove that I actually have uh, legitimate access. So that's a lot of words. Let's maybe look at a, let's maybe look at a um, animation to see how this works. I'm just gonna refresh, make sure we're kind of like start animation at the right spot. Uh, okay, so here we go. So we have Bob and we have Alice. Bob is trying to send some, you know, uh, assets, could be easier to Alice, right? So Bob needs to tell us, uh, hey, like this is the address for Alice, and typically it looks like a random string. And then Bob also needs to say, hey, you know, uh, oh, actually, no, this, this public address here is Bob's like public address. So Bob needs to tell us, hey, like, I got this money that's in this address, or I got this asset that's in this address from a previous transaction, and here's the transaction ID, right? So now we also need to know Alice's like public address. Uh, and then Bob's gonna be like, hey, I wanna send the stuff that's in my address to this address. And the last thing Bob needs to do is authorize this transaction to prove that he has legal access to whatever's here 
was a pub, uh, was a private key, and that's called a signature. Okay, cool. Um, so the next part of like how do blockchain is this thing called a Merkle tree. Um, in the most traditional blockchains, this is kind of how like things kind of add up and how you know there's a you know there's something funny going on in the blockchain or not, right? So it has to do with this idea of a cryptographic hash. In the simplest way, you can think of it as a function that's easy to go one way, but not easy to go the other way. So one simple example, uh, a terrible cryptographic hash is actually a sum function. So if I ask you for two random numbers, one of you will say six, one of you will say three, and then I'm like, oh, that's easy. You know, it's so easy to add them together. That's nine, right? Cool. But then if you tell me the sum of two numbers is nine, it's actually much harder for me to tell you what were the two random numbers you gave me, unless I already know that, right? So this is the idea of a cryptographic hash. And the sum is a very, very simplistic and uh, insecure version of that. So now let's just imagine transactions are simply numbers. So how do we merge them all together into a tree, right? So, okay, cool. I have like three and six and I'm going to add it together. I'm going to get nine. But then what if a new transaction or a new number comes in? Uh, this animation is a little bit slow. Okay. So a new transaction comes in, two and five. I'm going to add it together. I get seven, right? And let's say this is all the transaction I want in my block. So I'm going to sum the sum of these two together. I'm going to add up nine and seven and I'm going to get 16. So that is actually how you make a Merkle tree out of the transactions. And then the next part is like this idea of a block header. So imagine you're trying to move from uh, say Toronto to Montreal, and then uh, you have, you know, these like boxes, you're trying to put your stuff in there, you're trying to move it, right? When, you're, when the first box gets full, you kind of like close the lid, and then you maybe write on top, what was the content of this box, right? That's exactly the same idea of what a block header is. When a block is full of transactions, uh, we construct this block header, which is composed of the Merkle root of the transaction. You can think of this as the, uh, the summary of all the items that's in this current blocks you just closed. And then also the previous box hash, and then some random number. This is uh, called now, so you don't have to worry about this. So the reason the blocks chain together is because you're referencing the previous blocks hash, right? So you started with one block uh, that you just closed, you wrote the header on the, on the box, and then you put a new box on top, right? So when the second box that's on top of the original first box gets full, you not only write down what's in the second box, you also make a reference to like maybe the summary of what's in the box below. And this is how blocks chain together. And this is why it's difficult for people to, uh, you know, fool people on the blockchain. So let's maybe look at an animation to illustrate this. So I have this, I have this block that I just closed and then I was able to sum and I'm getting a header of like 16, right? Let's say I get another block and then I sum it up, the Merkle, the Merkle tree, the Merkle root, gives me 14. And I get another block that I'm closing, and then the Merkle root is fly, right? So at this point, I should be able to say, hey, you know, uh, at a point of like block header two, the block uh, block two, you know, the sum should be 30. And then at the point of like uh, block header three, the sum should be 35. But then if somehow someone's telling me, hey, the block header uh, adds, you know, the third block is 34, then I know like, that person is lying to me because I have all the information and I can sum it up very quickly and verify, you know, uh, if this is true or not. So once again, the way blocks chain is essentially just stacking boxes on top of each other. And then you can pick any starting point and you get that header and then you can go forward in time and you just add up the results and the results agree Then you know, you know, uh, you know, everything is true and everything is correct. And if numbers don't add up, then you know there's something wrong, right? So, um, all right, so we mentioned that the blockchain is decentralized, transparent, and immutable. So what does decentralized actually mean? It basically means that anyone with access to internet, like even, even on your smartphone, can listen to new transactions, and you can use the same algorithm to package blocks. Therefore, you always have a, you always have a copy of the universal truth, right? And then so when the block is like hashed together and packaged, uh, typically what miners do is they, they uh, what miners do is that they broadcast the results in the network. And the reason they do that is because if the result is uh, accurate and everyone agrees, the first person to broadcast the results actually gets paid by the network. So if they keep doing this repeatedly, there's a chance that they're, they're going to be the first one to kind of like solve the next block, broadcast it, and get a, get a payout. Because there are many, many miners participating in this race, 
um, you know, the chance of you being the being the winner is actually low, but then if you consistently do it, there is a long run chance that you will get a certain payout. And that's, you know, that's uh, like worthwhile in terms of computers, you have to buy and electricity, et cetera. So it's transparent because anyone with internet access can download the entire history of the blockchain. And you can verify uh, basically the history since the beginning of time as far as this blockchain is concerned by yourself. Therefore, it's very difficult for people to lie to you. And then it's also immutable because history cannot be changed. You basically need more computing power than the rest of the world or the rest of the participants on the blockchain because you need to basically unstitch all the blocks, change the transactions, stitch it back together, package it all together, and tell everybody, hey, this is the result. Meanwhile, everyone's still trying to like stitch blocks on top of each other. So basically, it's uh, infeasible unless you have more than like 51% of the computing power in the entire network, which is like very difficult to do. So um, anyways, I'll share the slides. There's like a bunch of other stuff that might be interesting, um, but I think I should probably go back to the other presentation now. Um, okay, so if you have been doing JavaScript, it's actually really good news because Solidity and JavaScript are like very, very similar, right? There's a couple like, uh, I guess key differences. So for example, Solidity is like is very uh, strongly typed and it's more object oriented. You have these um, essentially objects or data structures that's very specific. So there are these things called addresses. There's this thing called a contract. There's string and there's like integer and unsigned integer. So if you want the full documentation of the, uh, the list of the data structures that's common, it will be here. So I encourage you to read documentation. And then uh, the other thing that's a little bit weird about Solidity is that the way it uses like complex data structures. And this is actually like the first stumble point for beginner be beginner coders, right? So we have this thing called array, which is the same as like JavaScript list or array. Um, but then uh, you have to you have to be able to kind of like declare a dynamic one, or you have a fixed length array, right? So if you the idea of a fixed length array does not exist in JavaScript. But then in Solidity, if you de declare an array that only has three items or three elements, you cannot actually change that. You cannot add the force element in. So that's the, like, the minor difference there. And then we have these things called mappings. So mappings are typically what we in programming call dictionaries. It's actually just the key and the value um, you know, together, right? So for example, like the key will be name, and then in my case, name it will be Maddie, right? The age will be like, I don't know, uh, like it will be another key, and the age could be like you know, 28, 29, or something like that, right? So uh, it's like literally a list of keys and the values of these keys or a list of properties and the value of these properties. So that's what you use a mapping for. And this is like fairly equivalent to a JavaScript uh, object. But then the problem is uh, the mapping solidity needs to have the same type for keys and needs to have the same type for values. So in the case I just gave you, I just said, hey, uh, my name is Maddie and then my age is like say 25, right? Um, that actually doesn't work. It will work in JavaScript, but it doesn't work in Solidity mapping because uh, age is a number and name is string. So for you to make this work, you would literally have to put like 25 in quotes, but sometimes that's not like, that's not convenient. So then we have this object called structs. This is actually the closest to JavaScript objects because you can have different keys and different values. Um, and this is actually the easiest thing to nest. So one word of caution about nesting this is when you have like, you know, a couple levels of dictionaries or a couple levels of like a race. Um, it gets actually very complicated. So avoid doing that until you're like, you know, you have time to like, learn and experiment with that. Uh, so try to keep your objects flat when you're trying to learn initially to avoid confusion. And then there are actually um, other things that's like lower the strange about solidity. For example, there's these things called nested types, right? So uh, sometimes you'll see, you know, code like this, public string promise or public blah, blah, blah. So this public means anybody with uh, like a address could actually get the value of this um, the string, where anyone with this uh, you know, with address could get the, could actually just call this function, right? So that's this is a public function, and that's why you have this here. So if that's what public means, then what does private mean? Private actually just means that only the contract instance can call that method. So I might, I, want, I might want to have a you know, method on contract called self-destruct, but then I only want the contract itself to be able to self-destruct, otherwise not self-destruct, exactly, right? So I don't want anyone with address to be able to say, hey, I want this contract to just go die. Um, so that will be a, that will be a uh, method that you probably want to make private. So there's uh, another keyword called view and constant. 
this actually doesn't matter. This just means that this is read only. It doesn't change the state of this contract. So if you declare variables, that's actually kind of like a state. Um, it's kind of like you have a piece of paper and you're writing values on the piece of paper. So when you have a view or a constant function, it's literally just reading the value from the piece of paper and it doesn't write anything new on it. So these are actually interchangeable. And then the other one that's cool is called payable. So when you want to be able to pay money into a contract through a method, then you have to make it payable. So that's kind of like a short run through of you know, all the different things that make Solidity similar but different to JavaScript. Um, okay, so I have this very simple contract. I'm gonna maybe just copy into Remix because there's nice uh, syntax highlighting. So I'll do that here. So um, basically we're specifying what version of Ethereum compiler we want to use because Ethereum actually is under very active development and changes a lot. And if you use the wrong version, people will, you know, like the compiler will get mad at you and just yell at you. And then uh, I have this contract that's called I promise. So basically what it does is that it has a public variable uh, because of this here called a string. And then it has a uh, public variable that's Boolean. Uh, so this is basically true or false. And then uh, this right here has to basically come with every, every contract because every time the contract gets, gets deployed, this is the automatically executed method that basically makes an instance of this contract on the blockchain. So basically we need to be able to pass in a variable when we uh, deploy this contract. So it knows how to set the value of promise. And then uh, this is just automatically set to false. And then so basically what the contract does is that I'm basically saying, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm making a promise on the blockchain. I'm saying, hey, I'm gonna do this and that will be the promise. And then what, uh, and this variable here tracks if I executed that promise or not, like did I actually fulfill my promise, right? And then uh, this method here allows anyone, because it's public, to be able to call and say, hey, did Maddie do this or did Maddie not do that, right? So that's basically the extent of this contract. But what it will allow us to do is demonstrate CRUD, right? So create, read, uh, edit, and delete, right? So we're not gonna go over the delete part, but then I'm gonna show you how to create a contract, how to read from the contract, AKA get the value of uh, you know the promise and get the value of like, did this promise get fulfilled or not? And also um, be able to essentially um, like make edits to it uh, by changing the value of this variable. So I'm sure you played around with Remix before. I really hope you have. Um, so uh, what we can do is select JavaScript virtual machine, right? So if we do that, um, typically there is, okay, actually I'm not sure why this is not working, but um, what I'll do is actually skip to the deploy part, right? So, what I want to do is be able to deploy this contract onto a testnet so that, so that I can play around with it using the uh, Solidity interface. So what I can do is I'll show you the actual code in the repo. Okay, so if you clone the repo and pull it down, this is basically the folder structure you're seeing. Um, so I have two scripts here that's already written for you and what this one does is that it compiles the Solidity contract, which is actually stored here. This is the exact same copy, right? It compiles it into bytecode and gives you the ABI interface. So the bytecode is actually what the uh, virtual machine executes on the blockchain. And the ABI is essentially kind of like the API contract. Essentially you're telling JavaScript, hey, these are the things you can do with this contract and this is how you call them and these are the variables that I need, right? So um, this compile script is actually here. Let's look at it very quickly. So this is the Solidity compiler that I need to import. Um, so if you actually download this package, all you need to do is CD into the directory that's called hello world react Solidity and then do yarn run, or sorry, yarn, yarn install. What that does is that it goes and installs all the packages and dependencies. So this is a package, this is a package, and this package will automatically grab from JavaScript from NPM and install. So here's our contract and here's the compile script. I'm basically saying, hey, you know, go to this path and grab the contract here, which is the thing that we just copied over. Um, and it's saying, uh, Solidity compiler, please compile this contract, right? And what it will return is uh, the interface, which is uh, the ABI or, you know, the API contract. 
and also the bytecode, which is the thing that the, the virtual machine underneath the hood will execute. So what I'll do now is uh, I'm already in this directory. And what I'll do is I will go and do node compile. So basically what this is doing is running this piece of code. So as you can see, uh, you know, I'm printing the interface right here. This is the interface. So remember how we had a, uh, we had a variable called did happen. That's right here. It's telling JavaScript, hey, you know, you can actually get the value of this variable because it's public and blah, blah, blah. And then here's the bytecode that uh, the virtual machine will execute. This part we don't really care about, right? So you're like, okay, cool. So we have this contract compiled, but then how do I actually deploy it? So I also have this other piece of code uh, that deploys the contract for you. So the key thing here is that we're gonna grab the interface and the bytecode because this is what's required to deploy. And then also using this uh, HT wallet provider, um, this is a package that you get for free. Uh, it's able to make a hierarchical deterministic wallet and manage your keys. So you know what a wallet is probably. So what is a hierarchical, hierarchical deterministic wallet? It's very like hard to say anyways. Um, so basically this is a, uh, this is a kind of wallet where you can infinitely generate new keys for public addresses and keys for, uh, for the private key for that public address. And this is actually a very good security measure because if you keep using the same address, you keep using the same public key, people can start to figure out who you are and track you and figure out your transactions, which is not what you want. So with a hierarchical deterministic wallet, you essentially have a password that will allow you to keep generating new key pairs. And for every transaction, you can make a new address and you can um, uh, have a new key. And then that way it keeps you very anonymous and very secure. So that's what this package is doing. And then we have this package called Web3. This is roughly equivalent to the uh, to the Ether.js that you might have like learned about before. The thing is, Web3 is actually the older and more established package, and it has more functionalities and is probably more well tested than uh, Ether.js. So this is why I get to learn how to use Web3. This is still the industry standard. So this mnemonic is uh, I'll show you very quickly is essentially you know a bunch of words that serves as my password. Typically, you do not ever want to show anyone your mnemonic because they would have access to your entire account. So, you know, since this is a fake account, feel free, it doesn't matter, right? And then, so what I'm doing here is I'm saying, hey, um, I want you to actually deploy to this uh, IP address. You will see that this is saying Infura and this is saying Ring B. So what exactly is this IP address? Uh, what, what exactly is this URL we're trying to deploy to, right? So Ring B is actually a testnet. Um, so as you may know, the cost of cryptocurrencies are actually very high and it's very expensive. Uh, and every time you interact with a contract, typically you have to pay a small amount, right? And it really adds up. So what typically people do is that they set up a, um, a, a essentially a testing network, a fake network that runs pretty much exactly the same way as a real net, except the money you can get for free. And it's like, it's essentially fake and it's a good way for you to test your contract before you actually deploy into the real net, right? So always, uh, deploy your contract to the test nets first. And then after you've tested it, after people have like played around with it, maybe you set up a bounty and it's secure, then you can deploy that version into the real net. You don't want to deploy directly to the real net. And then, so what is Infura? Infura is actually um, a, essentially a infrastructure that allows developers to deploy to a test net or a real net without running a full node. Typically what you have to do is download the entire history of the transaction, start a new node on your local machine, so that has a connection to the, uh, to the Ethereum network, but that process takes a long time and takes a lot of like memory and compute and you probably don't want to do that. So what Infura does is that it provides a way to deploy it without having to run full node. So this is my private uh, Infura address um, that I can deploy to and you can get a same, uh, you can get the same address if you, or you can get an address for yourself if you just uh, go to like Infura and sign up for our account, right? So I think I can log in. Actually, I don't remember my login, so I'm just not gonna do that, but that's how you get your, uh, get your endpoint you can deploy to. So now I have this thing called a Web3. What exactly is Web3? It's basically a way for um, JavaScript, aka your front end, to talk to your contract on the back end. So what I'm saying here is that, hey, I want to be able to get an account from Web3, and then I want to deploy using that account. So notice how these are the variables I have to pass into Web3 for a contract to deploy, right? Um, so this bytecode is the bytecode that we generated from compile and it's being imported right here. So every time this deploy script executes, it actually runs the 
compile code again, but it doesn't matter. You can compile many times, it doesn't change anything. And here's the argument I'm passing in, right? Remember in our initial contract, which is right here, in the constructor, which is the thing that's run, uh, every time a new contract gets deployed, I'm asking the user to provide one variable, and that is a string, right? So this is a string right here. And this string is basically what I'm promising to do. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna say, hey, uh, I'm gonna promise that I'll have dry socks. Or I don't know, like we can say dry hat, whatever you want, right? And then uh, I'm gonna have to provide some gas because I'm interacting with blockchain and I wanna do it from this account, account zero. Uh, and we can just run this and see what happens. So I'm in the same folder again, and all I have to do is run node, uh, not compile because we actually want to deploy. So run node deploy. So it's taking a while, thinking about it. Cool, and you'll see that it's attempting to deploy from account one. And I'll explain where this account came from in a bit. So what I'm waiting for is a uh, confirmation of deployment. So if the deploy succeeds, it will actually say, hey, contract deployed to this address. And this is the public address of the contract on the blockchain. So still waiting, still waiting, still waiting. Okay, so I'm gonna let us do its thing. Uh, sometimes the network is a little congested. Um, so let me explain where this address is coming from. So you will notice that I have, uh, I have this like, uh, Chrome extension, and this is called uh, MetaMask, right? So you will notice that I have this set to the uh, Ring B test network, and I have some test ether. It will say like $200, blah, blah, blah. This is not real money. It doesn't matter. Like, this is actually something you get for free. And if you want to get some test ether to, you know, test your app, what you need to do is go to a faucet. So this is a faucet you can go to. If you make a, if you make an account on MetaMask, you can select what test net you want it to be, Here's your address, you copy it, and then you go through all the steps, you give it essentially the address, and it will give you some free Easter, right? Another one you can use that's maybe simpler is, uh, um, yeah, maybe this one. So I can directly copy in my address and say submit. This doesn't always work, it's not always fast, but sometimes it does. And this is the way you can get, um, you can get free, uh, free test Easter, right? So it's actually nice in saying, hey, here's your transaction ID. So I mean, what am I supposed to do with this transaction ID? One thing you can do is go to Ether Scan and uh, Ether. So, so go to Ether Scan. Make sure you're on the testnet version. Make sure it says Ring B or whatever testnet you're using that it matches, and you can actually look up that transaction. Uh, so it's just saying that it hasn't been like really included yet. So we'll check on that a little bit. So back to this, right? It actually deployed a contract using my MetaMask testnet address here, uh, which you get for free if you just sign up for our account, download MetaMask, install it onto Chrome, sign up for our account, you just get an address for free, and they actually deployed to this address, okay? So let's actually look at this address on uh, the testnet. So here's the transaction, and the type of the transaction that was sent to address, sent to this address is not surprisingly contract creation. Cool. So we were able to deploy an instance of this contract uh, to the testnet, which is like very cool. This is like real shit, right? So now what we can do is actually go to Remix and try to interact with the new version of the contract. So all I have to do is change from JavaScript virtual machine to injected web three on the run. You still need the same contract here, otherwise it does not know how to interact with the contract. And then what you have to do is basically update this address. So once again, I'm gonna copy this address here and I'm gonna paste it over here. And so if you go through the same steps with this code, you should be able to replicate the whole result, right? So, oh look, so it's now talking to this actual contract on the testnet instead of just a local version, right? So let's see, what did I promise to do? Oh, I said I would have dry socks, cool. And then, um, you know, uh, like, did it happen? Like, do I have dry socks? And the value is false, because until you do a thing, until you fulfill a promise, it's just going to be false and that's expected, right? But then what if I want to say, hey, you know, I actually do have dry socks. This is not false, it's actually true. So this is the cool part. You can actually just say true here because this is now executing the function called uh, said did happen, right? See how this name matches and you can just say go. 
And one interesting thing you will notice that because every time you interact with the blockchain, it requires some gas. It's actually going to ask me to provide some gas from my MetaMask account on the RingB testnet, which is what you get once again using this extension. So I'm going to say, OK, I approve that. I'm going to confirm. So what's cool is that uh, this transaction is actually right here. If we click on it, we should be able to see it. it takes a minute to actually get loaded, whatever. That's fine. So just waiting, just waiting, just waiting. And I think this one actually did succeed. So let's double check here. Takes a while. Let's see what happened here. Okay, so the transaction succeeded and now you can see you can see that this changed to true, right? So just for fun, I'm gonna change it to false again. So I'm gonna do that again. It's gonna ask me to provide more gas for my account. Then this is why you need test user. Otherwise you can't execute these transactions. You can't test your contract. And you should always test your contract before you deploy even to the test net, right? So once again, this succeeded. I'm gonna give it a little bit of time and I'm gonna check again. Notice how this is saying true right now. Uh, I'm gonna say it did happen and now it's false, right? Cool. So we successfully deploy a simple contract to the test net using MetaMask and Infura and we're able to interact with it using the Remix interface. But then you're like, okay, cool. Like this is nice, but this looks so ugly. I can't make my user use this ugly interface, right? So what else can I do? Well, this is where um, we go over the other part of the code, which is in React, right? So some of you who work with JavaScript will know React is like a very famous package and they're actually very nice. They provide you a way to essentially immediately get a React package going uh, by uh, a command called create react app, right? So just to prove it to you, I'm gonna make a new react app right now. So, uh, so this is my generic crypto folder, that's fine. So I actually don't remember the command, so yarn create react app. You can use yarn, you can use uh, npm, doesn't matter. This will work for both, so. Uh, So, okay, so I'm just gonna copy this command and I'm gonna do that, right? So I'm gonna say test test. So this is gonna run, it's gonna take a long time, but it's gonna make me a like JavaScript application like right off the bat. It's a template that immediately works and is actually a good base for you to start playing around with if you don't know how to like, uh, you know, entirely code up a new React app. So blah, 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 it's done, cool. So if I go list my directory again, you will see that it made a new folder called test test. So if I go CD uh, into this folder, so CD just stands for change directory. I'm you know, going to this folder. What I can do is say yarn start. Um, but before I do that, I need to exit my other one. Okay, so I'm gonna say yarn start and this actually just starts your newly created React app. So the address you need to go to so you will see that, hey, you can now view your React project that you just created at this address. So if I go here, so here you go, here's uh, your new React app, right? So if I um, go into the folder here, um, so, so once again, I mean the main directory for my crypto stuff, I'm gonna CD into a test. I'm gonna list the directory. There is a folder, uh, actually, so you need to go into the folder SRC, and there is a file called app.js. So if you open that, I'm using Atom to edit stuff, right? So what I can say is just change here and just say YOLO. I'll save that. And if I go back to my uh, window here, Oh look, it is now saying YOLO, right? So cool. So basically what I'm showing you is how to build a like very fast front end, but this doesn't matter uh, because I actually have a pre-prepared version that's already hooked up to the contract that we just deployed that we're gonna go over. So I'm gonna exit this one, right? So I am now back into the folder, uh, crypto hello world uh, react solidity. This is the folder that you should, have, you should have access to using that link. So as you can see here, Here's all the crypto stuff. Here's the contract. And here's the folder that I made by calling create react app, except now I gave it a name, I promise app, right? 
So same idea. Um, there is a source folder and there is app.js. And the stuff over here are you know commented out because I want to show you how to go from um, how to go from like the bare basics of what React gives you to how to get it to talk to the contract on the back end, right? So the things that we need to import will be Web3 because this is how you're gonna get your React front end to talk to the contract on the blockchain. Another thing you need to make is called a contract instance. So make that a JavaScript file and you import it and that's here, right? What you will notice is that um, here's the ABI, which is uh, what we get when we compile the contract. So the last time we ran the contract, that was, uh, that was here. So basically you just literally copy this stuff here and you paste it here. So I'm not gonna change this because the contract didn't change. This doesn't need to change. I'll just leave that, right? The other thing you need to update is the address. So because we just deployed this new address, I'm gonna copy the address here and replace it. So you will notice my instruction to say update address after deploy. Cool, so I'm gonna save this file. So now this is actually going to be able to talk to your, talk to your uh, contract uh, on the front end. So what I'll do is now I will go back to um, app.js and I give you like very specific steps for what to uncomment in what order, right? So the first thing you need to do is that uh, you will notice uh, on the front end, this looks very different. This is how it looks right now. What you should be able to do is uh, just uncomment this part. And this is how we're gonna set up essentially the interface that talks to contract. These are just like, blank numbers right now. And the next thing you need to do is basically set some like, you know, default variables for the things it's asking for. So you need to do step one and two, right? So I am now going to go back to my folder, not this one, uh, so not this one. So I'm gonna go back to hello world, react to and I'm gonna say uh, yarn cd into I promise. so yarn start. Uh, oh, this is interesting. Okay, so, so I forgot to install the packages that React requires, so you need to do that too when you first run this app. So just go yarn install in this folder and it will install all the necessary dependencies to get this app going. This will take a little bit. Um, so instead of waiting, I'm gonna go to a version that like I already prepared before so I'm gonna go yarn start here. Uh, huh. So, okay, I need to exit this one so there's no clashes. The reason that gave me an error is that I already had a application running on port uh, 3000. So it's like, hey, do you want me to run that in the, in the same port? And I don't want to do that. I don't want to clash. So I just said, no, I'm going to kill the other one and start a new new one, right? So cool. So because we uncommented some code, this now looks very different than the version we had before, right? So basically, these are the these are the values that I hard-coded in. So we know the promise was dry socks, and this account has that much balance. So it's actually pulling in a number straight from this account right here. So you will notice the unit is different. This is actually in way. And this is an ether uh, because Ethereum is actually expensive, but you see the first couple of digits matching. So I just proved you that we can actually talk to a contract on the blockchain using using React by using Web3. That's great. So the next part we got to talk about is how do we actually be able to interact with it, right? So you will see that I made two buttons here that uh, is basically going to be able to change the state on this variable. Um, it's equivalent to what we did before in Remix, where I basically set the state here. But then I want the user to be able to do that without using Remix, and that's why we have these buttons. So let's go back to the code and then uh, set this up. So we uncomment this part, and uh, we're going to uncomment part four, right? So I'm going to save the file again. So basically, this is the part that sets up clicking of the buttons. What you actually see here is that I'm saying, hey, you know, if the uh, did button gets clicked, I want you to call this contract uh, and I want you to call set did happen with the uh, the value of the button. So did I do it or did I not do it? And I want you to send this contract from account zero. Once again, this account zero is provided by MetaMask. And then uh, 
that's essentially it. So let's go back to the app. Um, let's go back to the app here. I'm gonna refresh. Cool. So it's saying currently the contract is that yes, I do have dry socks, but I want to change it. Now I want to say my socks is no longer dry. So I'm gonna click click on fail so hard, right? Cool. So it's gonna say, hey, you know, we're changing a state, you need to provide some gas. Do you want to use this account? I'm gonna say yes. And what's happening now is that it's actually telling me, hey, I just sent this transaction to the blockchain and we're now waiting on this transaction. This is actually a very important point um, because everything that you do on a blockchain is asynchronous because you're waiting for people to actually take your transaction and stick it into a block. Because it take a, takes a long time, if you don't tell the user what you're doing, essentially it just looks like you have like a very slow, very shitty app, right? So it's very important to have these messages to tell the user what you're waiting for. And as you can see right now, it's saying the transaction succeeded because uh, that actually got logged onto the blockchain. So this is still did, but if I refresh the app right now, it will say the status is nope, all right? So this is essentially how you can deploy a contract onto the testnet and how you can hook up a JavaScript front end to the contract instance. And so what I show you is how to create a contract, deploy onto the blockchain, how to read variables from it, for example, this and this, and how to be able to change the state, which is the edit part. So that's basically what I wanted to cover. Um, so if you have any questions, now would be a good time to ask. Feel free to ask in the chat. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen.